in uh, preeclampsia. And uh, this is a prelude for tomorrow when you're going to hear from one of the experts who was involved in the preeclampsia toolkit for the ACMQCC. So we'll get started with this um, and go over, and it'll be a continuation for tomorrow. So I have no disclosures. So first, I want to go over, as I said, we're going to talk about the new criteria, the changes, and then kind of discuss some of the highlights of um, the new document, which is a, an executive summary that was put out in 2013, um, and how it's changed the management and what the recommendations are. So we can't talk about preeclampsia without kind of going over what our significant advances have been in preeclampsia, and that's really been in the basic science realm. I promise I will not show any Western blots on this talk, so, but we will talk about um, some of what we know. So the placenta is important, and it's necessary for this disease process, and that is um, clear when you kind of look at what goes on, and you can see in this diagram, um, essentially you start with um, an issue and function in uh, placentation. So the cytotrophoblasts that are normally supposed to remodel the spiral arteries um, to go from a arterial um, architecture to a venous high capacitance become dysfunctional. And when they become dysfunctional, you get poor invasion into the myometrium, and you don't get as uh, adequate arterial remodeling and so that poses a problem, and what that poses is the placenta gets ischemic. It throws off various anti-angiogenic factors, cytokines, and you have endothelial dysfunction that happens at a maternal systemic level. And that's what we see when we see the clinical manifestations of preeclampsia. So with that, um, we also have to talk about the predisposition. And so what people believe on the thought that's emerging is there is a maternal predisposition to it, that it sort of unmasks some uh, something that the woman brings into the pregnancy, similar to when you see a gestational diabetic, they are at risk for having type 2 diabetes. So same thing happens with this uh, preeclampsia syndrome. So. Um, you can see the risk factors right there. I mean, some of them are clearly obvious with the type 1 diabetes, obesity, uh, lupus, obviously chronic hypertension. All of those are women that are at risk for developing preeclampsia. So the next thing is what is kind of new and emerging uh, and that is kind of a hotbed of research um, and, and future areas that we need to really delineate is the significant risks that continue after delivery. Now, we'll talk about um, the epidemiologic data that's out, but really this is a, a, a risk that this woman has much higher uh, cardiovascular disease later on. So the cure, as I used to um, you know, teach when I was a chief resident for OB and when I was an intern, I learned this in OB is that, oh, just deliver uh, the patient and they're cured. Well, that is uh, apparently not entirely true. So there was a big uh, meta-analysis that looked at um, the data on what happens to these women after they deliver. And really, one of the big issues is this. If they have preeclampsia before 37 weeks, they have an eight-fold higher risk of having cardiovascular disease later in life. That's huge. That's huge. And because of that, really, the experts in this area, and this um, is a citation from one of the leading experts and was the chair of this uh, hypertension executive summary, which is Jim Roberts, he points out that we should be evaluating these women when we see them for all um, pre-pregnancy and actually post-pregnancy. And so I, I put this up here for you guys to look at because these are people that you're going to see not just in obstetrics, but you may see them for gyne procedures or some other procedure later on and really asking the questions of what happened if they've ever been pregnant, did they develop preeclampsia, what, when did they deliver. These are um, uh, an evaluation of risk factors for them later on. So let's get to the executive summary. So this hypertension and pregnancy task force that was put together, it was the 17 leaders in um, both clinicians and scientists in preeclampsia. There, um, the chair was, was Jim Roberts, and one of the task force members is Dr. Uh, Maurice Drusen, who's going to talk to you tomorrow. Um, their um, plan was to come up with an executive summary. It is 99 pages, and I'm going to condense that for you. We will not show all 99 pages, um, but I'm going to give you the highlights that are important for us. 
So one of the things that they did is they classified preeclampsia um, and in a broad classification, they had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy of that. Um, there's four different classes. And then I put in asterisks, which I'll talk about in a moment, is this postpartum hypertension. These four are you know, pretty common that we've seen in various forms on labor and delivery. Um, one of them uh, is this gestational hypertension, which has kind of been a, a catchment for those patients that didn't quite meet the criteria of preeclampsia. The postpartum hypertension is not part of the classification, but they do make an important note in the um, executive summary that the reason they have this here is, is that we should always be looking for women who develop preeclampsia, even though they've had normotensive no issues prior to pregnancy, but immediately postpartum they can develop um, the preeclampsia, and which is something we should be looking for and not um, ignoring it if we think, oh, they didn't have it while they were actually pregnant. So it is, it is something that is, um, we need to keep our radar out for. So let's talk about the diagnostic criteria. Usually can't have a preeclampsia talk without this, and everybody looks at it and says, yeah, yeah, okay, we know this. But here is the major change, which I want to point out to you guys, because it is a change. So the blood pressure criteria there, as you see, um, it's the usual criteria, the 140 over 90, or if it becomes 160 over 110, um, that is either one of those uh, meet the criteria, but the difference is, is they have also and proteinuria, okay? So if they had proteinuria, you had to have both the hypertension and the proteinuria. The change is in the absence of the proteinuria, and you have new onset hypertension, and any of those things that you see below there, thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, impaired liver functions, pulmonary edema, or cerebral visual symptoms, that can trump the proteinuria. So you can still be preeclamptic if you don't have the proteinuria. And so the difference that in this criteria is they want to get out of the idea of atypical preeclampsia, where we've all heard that kind of thrown around. Well, they don't have proteinuria, so we call them atypical. Well, if you have thrombocytopenia, if you have any one of those things, you can still be considered preeclamptic. The other important note is they're now using um, either the 24-hour urine collection um, for the 300 milligrams, they've gotten rid of the five grams as part of the criteria for severe, but they also have put in the protein creatinine ratio, as you can see there. I'm going to mention the dipstick reading that's on there. This they qualify in the executive summary that you only utilize that if you are in a place where you don't have access to, to the um, protein creatinine ratio or you can't do a 24-hour urine protein. That should be sort of not something that is your first line. It's something that you can use as an ancillary. Um, if you're in a rural area or such. So the other important thing is you become severe preeclampsia, you, ha you have no more mild, so you become severe features of preeclampsia. So you're either preeclamptic or preeclampsia with severe features. We're moving away from this mild preeclampsia. And that's important um, because we're going to talk a little bit later about management changes. Okay, so severe features, those are very similar to kind of what we standardly talk about as severe features. And again, we don't, they've taken out the um, IUGR and they've actually taken out the five grams of uh, protein in 20, 24 hours. So let's talk about another way they're classifying preeclampsia because this also has an impact on management. They're really separating these early onset versus late onset. And they're defining that as prior to 34 weeks of gestational age for early onset and late onset is after 37 weeks. In between, it's really a gray zone. And if you talk to the experts about this, it, it, it is a gray zone. We don't quite know what to do with those patients. Um, their importance is really for surveillance while they're pregnant and their management for future pregnancies. And because you see the cardiovascular disease risk factors are much higher when you look at just the early onset preeclamptics. So, which brings us to what we can do for these patients who have um, had preeclampsia in the past, who are coming back for subsequent pregnancies. There's been a big push um, and a lot of studies that have been done. There's actually about 30,000 patients that they've looked at from various studies looking at low-dose aspirin. And in reviewing all of those studies, they've basically determined that the recommendation is if you have early onset preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy, that's really the patients that should be put on low-dose aspirin in your late first trimester. There also has been a lot of data on um, vitamin C and vitamin E, and there's currently no evidence that it's preventative, so they don't recommend using that. 
So this was a study that um, came out and actually was part of the guidelines that they put in um, the executive summary, and it really delineates the issue of where aspirin can be beneficial. If you look at that top category and you see right there, the um, prevalence. If your prevalence of developing preeclampsia with your subsequent pregnancy is 18%, and that prevalence is that high in women who've had either um, one previous pregnancy with early onset preeclampsia or two pregnancies with preeclampsia, your um, number needed to treat to prevent preeclampsia would be 56. So you um, can see where they recommend, why they delineate that early onset group. Um, it's, you know, two to six percent, percent prevalence is like the general population of pregnant women. So again, you'd have to treat, you know, 500 women or 167 women. So the recommendation is really with um, the early onset uh, preeclampsia. If they had that with their previous pregnancy, we should be doing aspirin. So that's sort of to help out the subsequent pregnancy. The other questions we have is how can we predict who is going to, once they're diagnosed with preeclampsia or they're diagnosed with preeclampsia with severe features, who, do we, who are these women that we need to really keep on our radar? Who are we worried about getting sicker? And there was a great study in The Lancet that actually tried to just look at this. And the reason that the study was developed is because they were thinking about in rural areas with limited resources, who do I transfer? Who's somebody that I need to be worried about? And so this um, study actually looked at various risk factors, looked at various um, morbidities, and found that the predictors were gestational age, interestingly chest pain or dyspnea, which we rarely ask, um, oxygen saturation on room air when they present, their platelet count, their creatinine, and their AST. So I have um, kind of a list there of all the things that they were looking at um, and trying to get predictors for. And the great thing is there's a calculator that is free and online to anybody. That's the um, site that you can go to. The calculator looks like this. So you have, it's called the Peers Trial, and it puts in, you can see there, I just, I put in a, a fictional case of someone 35 weeks, three days. I said they had chest pain. There, you can see their lab values. I got a um, probability of adverse maternal outcome in 48 hours would be 5.3%. Okay, so change that up a bit, and you can see I did just change one thing. I said now they have either chest pain or dyspnea, and now it's 16.1%. So we use this a lot on labor and delivery with the uh, residents and fellows, and when a patient comes in, we actually put in and, and calculate their, their peers' risk. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting tool that has been validated, and they're continuing to look at, at this, um, the collaborative group that, that worked on this. So let's get to um, important questions for you guys in anesthesia for the management and labor. Um, one of the common things that's been asked, thrombocytopenia. You know, what's, what's our cutoff? You'll find everybody has their cutoff. Um, I think it correlates highly with how many years in practice that you have been. Um, it starts to go lower and lower if you've been in more years of practice. So um, I really what I tell everybody is trends matter. There's not really an absolute number. Um, there's really actually no studies that look at a safe limit. There's plenty of case reports of, you know, the cowboys that put it one in and, you know, 30,000 and they did fine. But, you know, really there's no uh, rigorous studies on this. The ASA doesn't recommend a safe limit. Stability is the issue. And I'd like to point out something that I think is really important is we really don't have any data on the platelet count correlating with platelet function. So that's an important point. We're just extrapolating that. So really look at the trend. If it's dropping and the trend is looking like this, you know, I would think differently than if the trend is looking like this. The next thing that becomes a little bit controversial, magnesium sulfate for eclampsia prevention. Their recommendation um, is keep it infusing. So um, a couple things to note. So we don't, um, we don't have mild preeclampsia anymore based on the new guidelines. We have preeclampsia with severe features. So they're recommending mag sulfate for women who have preeclampsia with severe features. So that used to be our old severe preeclampsia group. We know that MAG prolongs neuromuscular blockade. That's why we get very nervous about it. MAG's half-life is five hours. So the logic here is 
if you discontinue the mag just before the cesarean delivery, you are potentially increasing the risk of seizure because you might be out of the therapeutic window for preventing eclampsia, and there's a lot of evidence and great data showing that it does prevent it. But you're not really getting out of that neuromuscular blockade issue that you're worried about. And the guidelines actually now are saying keep it going even if you go to section. In addition to that, there's definitely some good data out there for neuroprotection for um, preterm delivery, so less than 32 weeks. And the OBs are going to want to keep um, the MAG going on at the delivery of um, the uh, preterm deliveries, the gestational age being under 32 weeks. So we're going to be, you know, doing that for those patients as well. So keep it infusing. So management and labor, other issue, which was an ACOG guideline, and they were very, very particular about this, severe range blood pressures need swift attention. And they were so, um, this was such a significant issue that they've actually given pretty strict criteria in their ACOG guidelines. That comes from the data that I showed up there. Two-thirds of the maternal deaths in UK were from cerebral hemorrhage or infarction. In the US, when they looked at a case series of 28 women with severe preeclampsia, 54% died, and all but one had a blood pressure of greater than 160. So this is a real issue. You can see the guidelines there. Um, they recommend fetal surveillance when you hit those um, cutoffs, administer an antihypertensive, labetalol, or hydralazine. You repeat it in 10 minutes if it, you continue to um, meet that threshold. This is what we want to prevent. This is an actual case of a woman who had a hypertensive crisis with preeclampsia. So delivery recommend, recommendations. I put this in here. This is going to be debated not among us, but among the obstetric groups. And I can tell you at our own obstetric group, there's still some debate about delivery of gestational hypertensives or preeclamptics at 37 and weeks. So that's, I just put these up here for you guys to understand that, you know, there, we're going to see these um, preeclampsia with severe features. People are going to start thinking about inducing them earlier. They're even going to start potentially inducing earlier than we do now, um, which at 37 weeks for gestational hypertension. And then the chronic hypertension alone, not counting the chronic hypertensive with superimposed, are going to start being um, at 38 weeks being induced. So we will see these women coming in um, more frequently. So with my last slide, I talk about future directions. There is ripe areas of research and more questions than we have answers for preeclampsia. So it makes it very fascinating and uh, the syndrome that I love to do research on because we don't know. One of the major things that we need to be looking at, and the, the working group did discuss this, is we need to have more perspective trials to look at the utility. We've got great biomarkers, biophysical variables, but there's been no perspective trials on that. So that needs to really be evaluated. We need to actually characterize what subset of population are at higher uh, morbidity and mortality and what we can do to manage them differently. We now are getting into the early and late onset, but really what are those patients, what are the factors that we need to pinpoint and how can we change our management with those patients? And then really, even though we can identify who these women are, we need to start to think about can we prevent this or treat it? Because right now there's no um, pipeline for therapeutic treatment. There is a lot of mechanistic research that needs to be done for the increased cardiovascular resist, risk long term. So we have to understand what's going on mechanistically. And we have the epidemiology data to say that we know there's an increased risk, but we don't uh, have a lot of mechanism of what is happening with the placenta, what is it doing to the maternal circulation, how is it activating and making these endothelial cells on the maternal side uh, dysfunctional and what we can do to change it and treat these women long term. What antihypertensives or what type of management or follow up and surveillance we need to do for them. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.